Today my guests are Jeff McWhorter and Ben Hall. How are you guys doing? I'm good, good sir. Good. Uh, I'm excited to have you guys on here. You, uh, you just wrote a book. Yeah. What is it? So the book is called Testing ASP.NET Web Applications. Um, so basically we sat down when we were at PDC last year and we said there's lots and lots of really good resources online about how you do different types of testing. But there's not one centralized resource on how you can apply it to ASP.NET. So we sat down and we thought that would be a really cool idea. So the book basically walks you through all the different issues associated with testing ASP.NET. Okay. Um, and you guys are both web developers by trade? Yes. Uh, and you practice in testing all along? And you uh, yeah. in the print. I wouldn't say all along. Um, definitely started out on lots of teams that didn't uh, take testing seriously and then okay. uh, learned the value of it and think it's a really good thing that people should be doing. Yeah. Well, I've, I've certainly had you heard you yeah. evangelizing yeah. testing, uh, yeah. at least for the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about testing in particular. Um, or let's talk about web testing in particular. Why is it important? So testing in general is important. Um, basically, it's kind of a cornerstone of any successful project. Um, having a set of automated tests in place can really help a team kind of progress and actually kind of move quickly through the project, adding new features, changing features, refactoring the code, all with the safety net that you've got this nice testing layer, fit in there, will catch any problems which you'll kind of introduce along the way or could introduce along the way. Okay, so the big value is the, the refactoring part of it and uh, the safety that you mentioned. Yeah, that's definitely one kind of important aspect, just having that. Um, you can also, if you do things like test-driven development, then that can help you design better software. So more decoupled system, more understandable, more flexible code as a result. And obviously that's good for maintainability and going forward as well. Uh, so no more yeah. button-click events? No. Well, you know, the, whether or not you have code and button-click events is, is pretty much independent of the test, isn't it? Well, if, if you get a bun bunch of code in there, it's harder to test. It's so harder to test. It's harder oh, to test. Okay. You don't right. want to do that. You want to abstract things out. Um, but being a consultant going in, I see lots of people who put thousands of lines inside of uh, button click events. And it's just you don't want to do that. Just Why is that harder to test? Um, so um, basically, if you've got, let's take ASP.NET as an example, especially with web forms. You have your page. You double click, go into the um, button click event. If you want to write a test for that, you have to create an object. So if you're using a unit testing framework, such as NUnit or MBUnit, you need to be able to instantiate your object, call a method, and then actually verify the result. Now, button-click events obviously are void. They don't return a result. So that one straightaway makes it more difficult. Sure. Um, also, generally with ASP.NET, there's a lot of other baggage with it. Um, for things like HTTP requests, um, Context, kind of everything around. The so those are all required itself. in order to run a web page. Would that means they're they're required to run the test as well? In many ways, yes. And yeah. um, depending on how you write the code, obviously sometimes it's not. But for most of the time, a lot of the time, you do actually need these objects in place. And these are heavy objects, and they right. clip up the code. They make it more difficult. And you just want to move away from that. You want a nice clean object, nice clean event, um, nice clean method. Call that unit test again for that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned unit testing. Uh, what is unit testing? Uh, unit testing is the smallest uh, amount of work that you can do. It's the easiest way to, to think about that, um, the smallest chunk of code that you want to test. So um, you have unit testing, you have functional testing, and the book goes through and talks about all these different things. There's tons of different names. People call things different things. You have smoke tests, functional tests, unit tests, all these different names. Um, and a lot of times people call the tests the same different things. But the unit test is the very smallest level that you can do. So um, you take the UI out, it's just your, your testing, your, your logic. Um, so think of a calculator. You're testing the addition function, the, the subtraction function. You're just testing that little thing. You're not testing the, the actual UI or anything like that. Okay, and well, what form does that uh, test take? Um, so generally, um, how do you mean? Well, let's say I'm trying to test the add functionality of a calculator. Um, what, uh, how, how am I, just kind of describe how I'm going to test that. Okay, so um, if you follow a principle like test-driven development, the third thing you'll do, um, that's all about writing the test up front. So you kind of map out your vision of how you want to interact with the code, you map out kind of what you expect the code to return, and you write that from the test. So you're talking about the inputs and the outputs to uh, method? Yeah, fundamentally, you're kind of um, designing your API. You're designing okay. how you want to interact with the code. Okay. So you do the unit testing framework, um, 
and unit, very popular, very good framework. Uh, so create um, what is fundamentally a method in C sharp, an attribute with a test attribute. Create that inside of the test. You do calculator C equals new calculator. Then do uh, calculator dot add, pass in your arguments, and then verify the result at the end of it. So if you add in one and one, then the result should be two, and you'd have that other line in your test. And then based on the result, you, the test would pass or fail, whether that was correct or not. Okay, that sounds pretty simple. So I've, I know that uh, if I have an add method, I can call by that add method. I can pass in the numbers one and two, and I would expect to get the number three back. Um, is that enough testing to do, just to to test that it returns correctly when passing the proper parameters? Uh, it's a good starting point, um, but there's lots of other issues associated. Was that enough unit testing? I should say. So there's different ways that you can look at it. So if you're writing code, then yes, because you've got the code working. But you also then need to think of edge cases yeah. and how you want to interact with, say, if you pass in minus numbers, do that work correctly? Or pass in a null object or kind of other different sure. ways of interacting with a huge, numbers. huge number, yeah. right, or huge, huge negative number, right. Um, and then you just write test in a very similar way um, and just verify that your code works as you'd expect. Uh, are, are there, a are there a t unit tests that I need to do to test what I expect it to fail? Like invalid data? Yeah. So um, one of the things which the test will become is a form of documentation about how your code works. Mm -hmm. And being able to map out how the code works in unexpected situations is important. Because maybe if you do pass in um, an invalid argument, you want to test that it works in the way you'd expect. So throw an exception instead of just returning no, for example, the difference is quite important on how your code interacts with the rest of your system. Okay. Um, it's also for important going forward because if another developer comes on board and they see that and they do some refactoring, move some code around, you want to make sure that that, um, that path through and what, how it handles the invalid case correctly, you want to ensure that's consistent. Sure. You want to make sure that that's always valid. Going forward okay, that's your test to see that, uh, that the other developer didn't break anything later on. Exactly. But yeah. Uh, yeah, forget about the other developer. What if I did? If I wrote the code and yeah. I look at it six months later, yeah. uh, I, I'd like to make sure I don't break it. Exactly. And by having the test there, you can. It will remind you about what you were thinking at the time, okay. and it will catch it and just make sure. It's oh, it's still correct. documentation you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that that's good description of unit testing, I think. You mentioned some other kinds of testing. Right. So. Um, for example, and with your calculator application, if you put your calculator, it's, it's let's say it's a website. Um, have you used IE6 before? Have you used Firefox? You know, it, there's different things. How, how it's rendered on the screen is going to look different between the different browsers. Okay. So we have to do cross-browser testing. So we cover cross-browser testing, different tools that you can use for that. Is there a way of automating a cross-browser test? Um, nope. That's, that's, right now, it's like a manual test. It's, okay. a, it's a functional test. There's some tools out there. Um, there's some neat tools, um, actually, in the latest ver version of Expression Web that what it will do is it will overlay it. So Expression Web, a Microsoft product, um, you open it up in Firefox, you open it up in IE, they display next to each other, you can overlay them like this and kind of see where the differences is okay. and stuff like that. There's a couple other tools, um, IE Tester is another one that's a free tool out there that you can open up a whole bunch of different tabs and there are different IE tabs, um, see what it looks like. And, um, I mean the real problem that we have as web developers is IE6, that's where we really run into the issues and having to support it. And uh, you get your, get your site looking beautiful in Firefox and you do the bare minimum just to get the site to look okay and functional inside of IE6. So. So that's, that's another one of the tests sure. um, that we go, go through in the book, that type of manual functional testing. Um, the other big one is accessibility testing. Um, what does that mean? Um, testing for disabled, so um, disability. And the biggest one people think of on, on the web is uh, vision disabilities. Okay. But there's other disabilities that people forget about. So um, uh, if you have any communication um, auditory, um, some websites do that where you record different things and different stuff like that. Um, also, um, mobility disabilities, um, um, so different things with your hands. Um, do you, can you use keyboard shortcuts? Do you have to use a mouse? Um, and also cognitive disabilities, so reading disabilities, stuff like that. Those are the things that we talk about in the book. Um, we give different recommended reading levels for, for the websites because um, you don't want it too complex, So um, depending on the type of site that it is. Um, and a whole bunch of really cool toolbars um, with the, the uh, vision disabilities. Um, um, have you ever looked at your site as if you were had glaucoma 
Um, so we have some toolbars that we recommend to use that will simulate that you have glaucoma so you can see through the eyes of a, a person with glaucoma, which is, which is a really different perspective um, doing it. And the last few years, uh, web developers have been trained, you know, tables are evil, tables are bad, we need to move into a more semantic uh, markup um, with headers and stuff like that, breaking out into div tags and everything like that. And um, we talk about when it is correct to use tables. So the easiest way to think about that is tabular data. So if your data looks like it needs to be in an Excel report, you're cool with tables. Makes mm -hmm. sense. So yeah. what it is, in fact, rows and columns. So yep. tables and yeah. very much well. Uh, I'll ask the same question again for these um, uh, accessibility issues. Is there a way of automating those tests? Or um, something that's to the rules? And it's back to the manual. It's, it's back. You're going to have to do some manual stuff. And a lot of developers are scared of testing for accessibility. Um, the rules that are out there, um, they're, they're just horrible. They're written down very poor. They're written by government officials. They're written by lawyers. And it's really hard to go through all that paperwork to figure, figure that sort of stuff out. And what we did in the book is we put it into plain English. So this is what you need to do. And once you learn these rules, like five or six rules, it, you, you just keep doing it, and, and we have a couple tools, the manual tools that you run, and it'll say, you forgot an alt tag here, you need to put an alt tag here. So an alt tag goes on an image for alter, alternate text. So wow. if somebody can't view the image, you want to have something on there. Uh, that's the same for a reader. Correct, the screen reader like that. Yep, and that's another thing that um, we recommend you doing, is if you've never listened to your website in JAWS, run your website Web, run your website through JAWS. And what does JAWS do? JAWS is a screen reader. Okay. And it'll, um, there's a free demo version of it. You can download it and you can listen to it like uh, somebody with a vision disability, how, how they would use your website. Okay. And it's a, I, you know, pardon the pun, it's an eye opening experience. Yeah, experience. Yeah, I was just going to say that you made the accessibility rules more accessible to <laughs> <laughs> Nice. So we're nice. in. Nice. <laughs> so, but yeah, accessibility is definitely important. Yeah, and well, that's kind of my passion that I've been doing a lot of speaking on and a lot of stuff. But oh great, I think it's an underserved uh, part of the development, right? right. Uh, what other types of tests? Uh, there's a lot of different types of tests, and each one kind of requires a different focus. So for example, uh, you've got UI automation, so... Oh, that's a big, that's a hard one, right? Yeah, so as Jeff and said... For the reason you said before about the HTTP uh, objects, basically. Uh, so you're working out different contexts when you're automating UI, so basically, you've got two different problems. As Jeff said, doing cross-browser testing is mm -hmm. difficult because you're testing the way the file gets rendered. So it's very visual, and that's, you can't automate that. And going forward, I don't think you ever will. You need a human touch, you need to be able to look, feel, make sure it's correct. What you can automate, the functionality. You can automate that, making sure that the products are displayed. Making sure that if you go to, a, um, let's take Amazon. If you search for a particular product on Amazon, you can test to make sure that search works correctly, and you can test to make sure that products are being returned. Okay. You can't test to make sure that are displayed correctly, but you can at least get the core functionality in place. So I know how to test for that uh, with my mouse and with my eyes, uh, but that's not very automated. How can I improve that process? Uh, so there's lots of different frameworks out there. Um, so Watin is an example which we used in the book on how you can use C-sharp and use the C-sharp framework to actually um, automate the browser. So this will sit there and you can tell it to visit certain web pages, you can tell it to click links, and basically you can interact with the browser using just kind of a script. Um, and you can structure that in a way that makes it very readable, very maintainable, and you can model the behavior of how your application works in kind of from the viewpoint of the user. Okay. Um, and that's how you would automate it and then go through the same process as you would. So does, does Watton actually launch a browser? and then you script it to say, uh, enter uh, something into the search text box, click the search button, and validate this actual reasonable yeah, that's that's yeah. Right. Yeah. right, and the thing to note are these are what are considered fragile tests. So if you change your UI, um, you're going to have some issues with the, 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 the big test suite that you spent a lot of time writing based on that existing mm -hmm. UI. So there's some tips and tricks that we use about um, abstracting those tests out and how to how to do that to make it much easier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, mean, I, I actually would argue that uh, all the tests are fragile for the exact same reason, but only the UI you can right. call attention to because that's more likely to change right. than, say, your database, for example. Yeah, and uh, the last type of testing I think that we cover, I think we covered some manual testing and stuff like that too, but the other big session, section in there is performance testing, which is a very big thing that a lot of people wait to the very last minute to do on a website. 
and we go through um, all kinds of different things, how to load test it, um, capacity planning, um, and it's great to, when you have a larger client to know our website is going to fail at X number of users. We anticipate we're going to get X number of users on this date, and then you can plan for hardware, which is great instead of having to, to run around on the Saturday night of your vacation when you hit that and sure. your, your website goes crawling. And, and I, I'm sure many of your listeners, that's happening too. You know, you spent all these hours on this website, it works great, awesome, you put it into production, and then all of a sudden it just crawls along. And you're like, oh man, what do I do? So we go through all the tools that you need to use to, to figure that out and, and do that. What are some of the tools? Um, we go through a lot of stuff with the Visual Studio Team Test stuff in Visual Studio 2008. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about that, those sort of things, those load testing tools that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a uh, there's a Python one um, that I actually just learned about at Code Nash today called Pilot. Um, it kind of automates stuff and, and um, lets you see how that stuff's going. Um, we talk about browser mob too, so that is one that is for uh, using Amazon S3 storage which is really nice and their processing capability out there. So if you don't have a large lab where you can bring up 15, 20 different servers to, to run a load test, you can use this service and um, you pay for processor and what, what you use and it'll bring it up and perform a really good load test. Oh, it's pretty to the cloud. Right. Uh, is that, so is it, I know it's not a good idea to wait until after you actually deploy and put it in production to find discover your uh, capacity problem or your performance problem, mm -hmm. but is it, um, is that something that you really should defer to the end, or should we think about that from the very start? Definitely from the very start, but you get the chicken before the egg sort of thing. You don't want to do a really large load test um, before your whole system is, is complete, but you definitely want to do some stuff. There's some tools. Um, there's a, um, Firebug has some stuff in there to see how fast your pages are loading. Uh, Yahoo has a tool called Y Slow that every developer should have on their page, on their on, installed on their machine, and when they're going through these pages, they should be looking at that and just making sure, um, looking to see if the response time are acceptable. If you're getting response times that are four or five seconds on your developer machine, you're probably going to get that on production too, so it's right. a good indication. Um, and then um, in an agile process, probably at the end of every sprint, I would recommend running a, a larger load test. Okay, and if you automate that, that's not a big deal. Right. You don't have to spend uh, right. a lot of time optimizing things prematurely. Right, and the tools in Visual Studio are great because they have all kinds of nice charts and all this sort of stuff, and it's real easy to get manager buy-in because those managers love those charts. They love looking at all, all those things. Chart feeds. Yeah. Are you talking at all about uh, Visual Studio 2010? Nope, no. Nope. Uh, you look at those tools? Oh, yeah, the, the, the Camino stuff is amazing. Oh, look at Camino. This is yeah. like TiVo for you. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. They can do some really cool stuff with that. All right, that's another show. I just wanted yeah. to uh, yeah. throw that out there because yep. I was uh, I put a lot into the testing tools of 2010. Yeah. Uh, and what is a smoke test? <laughs> a smoke test is just a quick test to. Um, I guess a good example of that would be with um, the performance stuff. Um, what we could do is we could just run a very small test, not a full load test, just maybe like half of the test or a quarter of the test to see if we have any performance issues. And if we, because we may have performance issues right off the bat, and we can catch those with just a couple tests instead of running a full suite of tests. So we want to smoke out the issues first before we try to run a full suite of tests. Oh, you know, I always thought that the term came from when you have a machine, you just want to turn it on and see if it starts smoking. <laughs> bad. But if it does, then you know it's failed the test. Okay. I always think of smoking it out. All right, I don't out. know. I can't say the Wikipedia will know. I'm it's sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else you can share with us? Um, the book writing process. Um, that's yeah. a great process. Oh, let's talk about that. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Definition of great is it's interesting. You're using yeah. the word great. I guess we have a disagreement <laughs> on this one here, don't we, Ben? Uh, uh, how, how did you get started with that book? Um, the story itself, so with that PDC, um, we had a few beers at the attendee party, which was awesome. Um, the on story the is totally believable so far. <laughs> yep, yes, <laughs> completely. Um, and then met up with Jeff um, on the Jurassic Park ride, you know, uh -huh. there, just going up the slope, and it's like this log flume type ride. Uh -huh. So Jeff was talking to me, you know, just about to go over the, the dip down, and Jeff goes, so. Let's write this book. Let's do yeah. it. Oh! <laughs> exactly. And I don't know if it was from going down or the <laughs> Jeff made, but yeah, we got to the bar and said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So. Oh, that's cool. And Jeff, I happen to know is from uh, Mid Michigan, from the Lansing area. And uh, you're not, are you? I'm not indeed. So I'm Where from the from? UK. Well, that presents some challenges if uh, you're in one time zone, isn't it? Yeah, it was about seven hours. 
time zone difference. About so that, yeah, yeah um, I'd be working late on the book, and Jeff would be getting home from work, and we'd have a chat. We'd use Skype a lot, um, use MSN, and yeah, you know, I'd be half asleep. Jeff would be bright and perky. <laughs> I made for an interesting phone call. Oh yeah, four o'clock at Ben's time, I'd give him a call. Hey Ben, you get this done, and you know, it, but. The other side of that story, it was great because somebody was constantly working on the book. You, know, you look at the version control at the times, it was like a 24 hour. It was just Ben was checking things in early my time, I was checking things in late his time, and it was just constantly, it, it, was, it was cool that all that stuff was getting done so quickly. Well, that's right. So you use version control for. Uh, oh, yeah. But what did you use? Uh, we used SVN. Um, okay. We used a service called Unfuddled, and we had um, project management in there and all that sort of stuff. I don't really th usually think about. Uh, uh, version control for things that aren't code. Right. I have a big problem with change tracking in Word. I'm not a big fan of it. Okay. And um, uh, Tortoise SVN has some nice things with Word documents for doing diffs and stuff like that. Okay. And um, it, it was nice to have. It also just made document sharing a lot easier yeah. between us. Cause we could throw it up into the cloud and then just do an update and you'd get all the changes. So it just made it much more easier to manage, nice central place. It's backed up. So I also. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's really yeah, it something I haven't thought of. Uh, so, did you ever figure out how many hours did you actually spent? <laughs> uh, I don't think we really want to mention how many hours, but um, it was uh, we spent about six months on the book, and it was working um, pretty much every day from five thirty after work till about two o'clock in the morning my time. Um, yeah, so my wife Carla um, definitely I've been making it up to her ever since with uh, spending some time with her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Okay, so uh, you want to make sure that Carla stops listening right now. Next <laughs> question: Will you write another book? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I've kind of recovered, so yeah, I'm starting right. to the, the nasty late nights are slowly disappearing, and so yeah, I'm sure something will happen. You have an idea? Couldn't possibly tell. Couldn't possibly say they write one together. I would definitely do another book with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Jeff is awesome. Sorry, yeah, it, was a, it was fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's uh, fun now, so that's all that matters. Uh, hey, uh, so before you go, where can people find out? Well, first, uh, it, is there a website for the book? Yep. yep. Uh, www.testingfpnet.com. Okay. And uh, is there a website for Ben Hall? Yep. blog.benhall.me.uk. And for Jeff? Uh, www.mcwerder.net slash blog. Um, yeah, without technology, Ben Hall and I would not be friends. <laughs>